the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. October has all of my favorite saints, and the saints of the big way and the saints of the small way are both in October. We have these big way saints. Look at St. Isaac Job, St. John Brabuff, these saints in upstate New York who were tortured mercilessly for 17 hours for the Catholic faith, for Christ, for the spread of the Catholic faith. Read just that story once and you'll never feel good about missing a mortification or a dessert again. But then we also have these small saints that I'm going to look at in this sermon. They were also this past week, St. Michael the Archangel, St. Therese, St. Francis of Assisi. What's the difference between a big saint and a small saint? You know, I think we traditionalists, I include myself in this category, a lot of times we try to be these big saints where we take it on our shoulders to fix all the problems in the church globally and we get really worried about this stuff and, and we can get scrupulous and, and then what does it mean to be a little saint? Well, obviously, probably most people here know of St. Therese. St. Therese's way was to just be a child sitting on the lap of Jesus, trusting in Christ. Maybe we could even see a little bit of that in today's gospel, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, Matthew chapter 9 here, where we have the scribes who are very, very worried about the law, and then you have this paralytic who has no other option but to rest and to trust in Jesus' healing power. Well, obviously, when we think of that little way of being just existing in childlike trust of Christ, We think of two of the saints that we've had the past week, not just the paralytic in the gospel, but maybe you think of someone like St. Francis of Assisi, who is October 4th, or the day before that, St. Therese of Lisieux. Well, St. Therese and St. Francis, they are childlike. They exemplify the little way of joy and trust, much like the paralytic had no other option but just to trust Christ. But I think, and I'm including myself in this, so I'm not ripping on anybody out there, There's been times in my life where I followed St. Therese, but I think I've kind of moved on to the bigger way saints to say, that was nice when I was a child, but there's bigger battles in my life. And now I have to take things seriously, fixing the church and all these other things. I want to show you the error in my own way of thinking, not to project it on you all, but maybe we're in the same category. And I think that many of us at the traditional Latin Mass have become mighty warriors for church issues. A friend of mine in New Orleans who's a father of children, he himself only goes to the Latin Mass, says that trads are, quote, the abused children of the church, close quote, insofar as many of us have been trashed by church hierarchy for simply trying to be Catholic. I would put myself in this category. And so when this happens, we start to look to be big saints. I want to propose today that it's time for us traditional Latin Mass people to return to the little way of St. Therese. I'm going to give you two quotes from popes of the past hundred years. Pope St. Pius X called St. Therese of Lisieux, quote, the greatest saint of modern times, close quote. The greatest saint of modern times. Pope Pius XII called St. Therese of Lisieux, quote, the greatest healer of modern times, close quote. Think about those two quotes for a minute. Therese, this saint who proposes nothing but surrender and gratitude before Christ, being called by this heroic battler of the heresy of modernism, Pope St. Pius X, the greatest saint of modern times. I mean, the first time I started reading about Pope St. Pius X, when I first started getting interested in tradition about halfway through my priesthood, I was reading about this man, and he seemed like the most gentlemanly pope who fought who brought fatherly protection to a new level. When I first saw a picture of him, I thought, he looks like a football coach for a big university in Georgia, more than kind of like a soft intellectual. He's a real father. And yet, Pope St. Pius X, this total destroyer of the heresy of modernism, calls St. Therese the greatest saint of modern times. How about Pope Pope Pius XII calling her the greatest healer of modern times? Why would he call this girl become a nun who died relatively unknown of tuberculosis at the age of 24 and I think 1903 in an obscure northwest Carmel in France, why would she be called the greatest saint of modern times, the greatest healer of modern times? Well, let me give an example of what happened after her death. 1928. Imagine 1928 Iowa. 
There was a 14-year-old girl named Emma, and she got possessed with four evil spirits because her aunt, who is involved in witchcraft, put a spell on her. This is all in Iowa, and the exorcism started, but the priest, by the end of this exorcism, was losing all of his endurance. There were priests and nuns around praying, but the priest was losing this battle of exorcism. Innocent 14-year-old girl had these four spirits, Judas, Beelzebub, possessing her. One account reads this. During the exorcism process, it was noted that Father Theophilus seemed to age 20 years. Father Stiger was reaching his own endurance limit, and the sisters approached collective breakdown. But they became hopeful after St. Therese of Lisieux, known as the little fa- known as the little flower, appeared to Emma saying, do not lose courage. The end is soon at hand. On the ceiling, they saw roses, traditionally understood as evidence of Therese's intervention. On December 23, 1928, Emma broke her grips of the spirits and stood up. Father Theophilus blessed her, shouting, Depart, ye fiends of hell, be gone, Satan, for the Lion of Judah reigns. Voices of the spirits around responded, Beelzebub, Judas, Jacob, Mina, hell, hell, hell. And as they faded, Emma opened her eyes. Her first words were, Praise be Jesus Christ. The entire company of priests and nuns broke down into tears. Did you hear that part? On the ceiling they saw roses traditionally understood as evidence of Therese's intervention. When nobody else could do it, it was the little saint who showed up. We think of her as just sweet enough to give you a toothache, and here she is at exercising demons. best book I ever read on her is a retreat called I Believe in Love by Father Elbe, and I probably read it ten times through, so if, you, if this is a totally foreign sermon to you and you want to know a little bit about St. Therese, maybe get the book called I Believe in Love. It's very, very good. If you're struggling with trust and you want to learn how to trust God more, I know of no better book than to get than uh, I Believe in Love by Father Elbe, priest in the 1950s who wrote that as a retreat for nuns. I want to before we look at these other two saints, um, St. Francis of Assisi and St. Therese, I want to just look at the gospel today of St. Therese last week. It says, quote, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in their midst and said, amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whoever therefore humbles himself as this little child, He is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such little child for my sake receives me. Close quote. Imagine being in that time in Jesus. Imagine seeing Jesus before the crowds and someone asks him who is the greatest. Imagine you didn't know the answer to this question. Wouldn't you think that maybe he'd pick Peter? Maybe he'd pick John knowing that he's, you know, Peter's coming martyrdom or John resting against the heart of Jesus? Wouldn't you expect probably Jesus at that time to pick one of the apostles as the greatest. And yet he takes this child, puts his hands on his shoulders, unknown child, we don't even know the name, actually tradition does tell us it was St. Ignatius of Antioch. And he says, this is the greatest in the kingdom. Can you imagine seeing that? Taking a time machine back and seeing that? Why are we surprised? I think it's because we all get so old through our wounds that we're no longer sincere with God or others that we can't imagine that. But children have no filter, as most of you know. There's an honesty. I always joke that whenever a traditionalist says to me, Father, with all due respect, I know I'm about to get disrespected. Not here, it's mostly online. But children just speak their mind. They don't need all these little bumpers before and afterwards. Children just speak their mind honestly. I'm sure that most of you have kind of had certain excoriations from the mouth of a five-year-old that you didn't expect to see your own issues with. I know that's why I love being back in campus ministry with is in university ministry, they don't let you get away with anything. I was talking about why I don't do hour-long spiritual directions 
uh, to several women at the University of Florida. I said, I only do 15 minute ones because people can just want more and more time. And she said, I said, well, not because I'm that good, not because I'm that special. And she, this one girl goes, but really you are, right? And she was teasing me knowing that she had caught just a little bit of pride. And I immediately realized I had been caught in pride. That's what's beautiful about being, you know, being around students again is they um, help you to be sincere with yourself just like children do. Because, see, children speak their mind without a lot of subterfuge, and I think we need to move to that again. I can appreciate that. St. Jose Maria wrote in this way that we're to be, quote, a child with God, and because of that, very much a man in everything else. Be little, very little. Don't be more than two years old, three at the most, for older children are little rascals who always want to deceive their parents with unbelievable lies, close quote. That's the way or Camino number 858 and 868. So you see there, what St. Jose Maria is saying is that the little way of being a child actually makes you more manly because it gets rid of all this insincerity and games and trying to appear to be the most pious and perfect person. Children just go directly to the heart of Christ like Therese did, just like the paralytic in the gospel. He had no other option because he was so weak and wounded. And the truth is, we are too. Even though we go to the Latin Mass, we are too. And when we understand what it means to be a child, we can be honest before God, even about how weak and sinful we are. This is what it means to be vulnerable with our Father. And I know this is hard for so many of us, myself included, who have very many wounds. But we especially need to heed the way of St. Therese, be little, very little. Amazing that St. Jose Marie even gives us an age. Don't be more than two years old. Three at the most, for older children are little rascals who always want to deceive their parents with unbelievable lies. Okay, we're talking about three saints today. Let's move from Saint number one, Therese, to Saint number two, Saint Francis. I'm not going to spend as much time on Francis and uh, Saint Michael as Therese, but let's look at Francis. You know, Francis, one day later, he was just as based on being a simple child before God. And, the gospel for his day in the traditional Latin Mass also came from St. Matthew, but this time from chapter 11. It says, quote, at that time, Jesus spoke and said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to little ones. Yes, Father, for such was your good pleasure. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and him to whom the Son chooses to reveal him, close quote. That's Christ in St. Matthew chapter 11. You know, and Jesus is talking about the apostles. I think one reason Jesus chose these blue-collar workers, these fishermen, to begin the new priesthood instead of taking from the ranks of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and we hear today in the Gospel about the scribes. Scribes are those who knew the law very well. I think the reason Jesus chose these um, blue-collar workers for the new priesthood instead of the Pharisees is because the Pharisees were caught up in all kinds of games of theology with God. And in all honesty, I think that's where we traditionalists ironically have the advantage over liberals today because I find it's liberals who are constantly playing these loopholes and games of conscience. Where we traditionalists, we do want to just approach God as he is without games. And in this sense, we do have the advantage in fact, St. Francis must be the saint rolling around most in his grave at how many people make him out to be a philanthropic hippie who had no sense of justice. G.K. Chesterton shows us how wrong we moderns are about children when he says, quote, for children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. Not an excellent quote. For children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. So we have to get rid of this idea that to be a child is to be wimpy. No, it's when we trust that God makes us strong. Amazingly, I think we can even apply this to our third saint. He's not in October, but he is in the past week, St. Michael the Archangel. Now, in the new calendar, those three archangels are put into one day, but as you know, in the old calendar, they each had their own day. So September 30th was St. Michael the Archangel. Remember that St. Michael was of the lower choir of angels. There's nine choirs of angels. He was actually from the second to lowest. 
we think of him as extremely high, but of the nine choirs of angels, the nine, the, the highest being the seraphim, closest to God in glory, and then all the way down to the archangels and angels, the second to last is where Michael comes from. And I discovered that last week's St. Michael the Archangel Gospel is the exact same as the gospel chosen by the church of old for St. Therese, Matthew 18. Now, why do you think that is? I think it's because he came from the lower ranks of angels. It's kind of ironic because we think of him as this great warrior. But here's how they're similar. St. Michael defeated Satan, who was a higher choir of angels. Remember, they say that Lucifer came from either the seraphim or the cherubim. He was kicked out of heaven by St. Michael. And it was St. Michael who was able to accomplish that through trust in God, through knowing his place before God. St. Michael knew he was not God. That's what Michael means, Mikael. Who is like God? It's his war cry. Nobody's like God. And that's the very dangerous thing of spiritual pride as we become satanic. We think of ourselves as God. But St. Michael never did. He knew he was of the lower choir, but it was his trust in God that made him so strong, he was even able to defeat Satan. See how this is a little bit like Therese being so powerful at that exorcism? St. Therese says, God does not ask great things of us, but only surrender and gratitude. I think we men especially rarely think of surrender and gratitude as the way to become very manly, masculine saints who can teach for our families, protect for our families, provide for our families. But St. Michael shows us it is. Leo XIII called St. Francis the closest image to Christ that ever was. Later in my life, I had heard that some people said that St. Therese was the nearest image of Mary, the mother of God that ever was. I was wary of that when I thought of all these saints with all these crazy miracles like St. Catherine of Siena, St. Christina the Astonishing. I wasn't sure I liked Therese being called the new Mary. I'm not sure she is, but I'm not so wary of that anymore because I now see the power of abandonment and surrender and that that was the core of Mary's heart is abandonment and surrender, making her the greatest saint, greater than all the angels, too. Think about it. Lucifer was a great saint, if we take saint in the general term to be holy, I'm not saying he had a human nature, because we know he had an angelic nature. But Lucifer was too great for his own good, just like the scribes in today's gospel. Lucifer did not know how to be small and accept God as being God, God as being his father. And this was Mary's greatest gift, at least interiorly, besides being the mother of God. She allowed God to be God, even to his permissive will, allowing the public execution of their son, Jesus. In that scene in The Passion of the Christ, remember when Satan looks threateningly at Mary, and Mary looks peacefully back at him, not with anger, but just knowing she will be the one to crush his head. You see, it's not even a fair match. God versus Satan is not a fair match. Satan versus Mary is a fair match. And Mary crushes his head in that way of trust. That's why there might be bigger ways than the rosary. But the key to victory is like what I said last week, the rosary will be our way. You don't have to like it. St. Therese of Lisieux, in fact, said the rosary was like a hair shirt to her. She didn't like it, and she admitted it, but she did it anyway. This is the way of an obedient but joyful and trusting child. So what I want you to get from this sermon is that the little way of St. Therese is the key to big things like exorcism. We hear the quote of G.K. Chesterton applied to St. Francis, that children are innocent and love justice, while most of us are wicked and naturally prefer mercy. Finally, we're reminded that St. Michael was one of the smallest angels in heaven, but, be but because of trust and obedience to God, he was more powerful than even fallen seraphim like Satan. The little way is the strongest and most manly. Maybe this is why St. Therese tells us that God, again, does not ask for big things, but only gratitude and self-surrender. The scribes thought they had it all figured out, the paralytic had no other choice but to trust Jesus. 
Yes, this is why the little way of St. Therese, of St. Francis of Assisi, of St. Michael the Archangel will always win, even for us traditionalists, because as St. Therese says, it is trust and nothing but trust that will lead us to love. It is trust and nothing but trust that will lead us to love. So says who St. Pius X calls the greatest saint of modern times. Love conquers everything that is mighty and ugly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.